Garrett. I am the responsible party for bringing Dr. Guy McPherson to Fairbanks to share with us his research and what he believes is something that we should all know. Um, last night his presentation went over very, very well. We had great Q&A after and I know that we will do that again this evening. Um, at the end, before Q&A, we'll do an auction from a local cartoonist, Ranji, who prepared a very funny cartoon. You'll see a big image of it later. It's Fairbanks Preppers Contemplate the Impending Apocalypse. And we'll do an auction afterwards if anyone would like to do that um, in contribution to Dr. Guy McPherson's tour. This trip to Fairbanks begins a five-week West Coast tour. He's in Fairbanks, and then he goes to Juneau. He'll give two presentations there, and then off to San Francisco, and he'll make his way up to Portland to complete the five weeks. So we're lucky that we get him at the start. He has enjoyed being in Fairbanks. He got to visit Kramer's Field and see some of the impacts of the loss of permafrost there. And um, we get to go to China tomorrow, so pretty good visit. Um, like I said, I'm the person responsible for bringing him. His message can be a bit heavy. It is about near-term extinction, a, a um, term that he has coined and will introduce us to. And I encourage you, if, if, you, if it will be hard for you to receive this information, I want you to know that Lots of us have ha gone through it before, right? Like we've heard that this is happening, we've decided that we buy into it to some degree and we're living our lives now accordingly. And there is support to help people uh, come to terms with what's happening. And for our students, please talk to me personally after this, I'm here for you. And we have resources on campus at the Health Center as well. Um, at the end, we will have a Q&A as I said, and Dr. Guy McPherson is selling his most recent book, only Love Remains. He has a soft copy, $15, and a hard copy for $30. He will sign it for you or your friend who you're gifting it to. Dr. McPherson does his touring at no charge. He believes in the message that he has to share. Uh, it doesn't bring him a whole lot of joy to share it, but he is a very joyful person and a very funny person, and you may get lucky to hear some of his jokes tonight. I've been quite pleased with how funny he has been and how much I've laughed uh, these few days. So we'll take up a love offering. We'll pass this honey pot around, and if you feel compelled, please feel free to give a little gift of gratitude for Dr. McPherson at the end. Um, at this time, I invite you to silence your cell phones. Thank you so much. And um, please sign in. We have sign-in sheets on either side. We are inviting people to a dialogue tomorrow night. I know some of you were here last night. I thank you for coming again. And we've asked people to put a star next to their name if they want an email about the conversation that we'll be having tomorrow, which will be, we've decided, at 7 o'clock in the cafe just in this building. So we'll gather there and we'll um, have a less formal discussion. And I encourage you to attend and to share that information with your friends. Yeah. So thank you so much. Enjoy the presentation. Um, take notes. Ask questions at the end. And I look forward to seeing you again then. May I introduce Dr. Guy McPherson? <laughs> Thank you, Keshe. Keshe has been an amazing hostess, and I very much appreciate her efforts to bring me here, which does nothing for her, and as nearly as I can tell, it does nothing for me. So it's great to be here, I guess. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. I know that you have many important things you could be doing, and I know that your time is short, so thank you for coming. I'm going to tell a couple of stories to provide a little context. I'm going to present the barest bones of evidence. I focused heavily on the evidence in my presentation last night, and I've written and spoken extensively, so if you want to 
bring some emotional trauma into your life, you can type my name into your favorite search engine and catch up on all the latest evidence. And then I'll talk a little bit about what do we do? And the question comes from Garrett Hardin, the famous ecologist in the 1960s and 1970s, who responded to every fix or every solution with the question, and then what? So that's, that has become known as the ecologically literate question. How do we respond to a situation depends upon the knowledge we have, the outcome we desire, and also the precautionary principle, so that we don't do something thinking, hoping, wishing that it might work out, but not realizing the full impacts. So that's the general outline. I'll start with a little story. First though, this is the, the graphic artwork that appears on my latest book, which came out in February of this year. And my partner, Pauline, who's behind the camera over here, created this cover. And she did so out of pictures she took from three different countries. Most of the picture is from a beach in New Zealand, from a tour we were on two and a half years ago. The children are the son and daughter of the caretaker of a property in Belize in Central America. And Pauline asked them to throw rocks into the jungle, the garden in the jungle. And somehow those turned into the starfish that were on Pauline's sister's wall in Orlando, Florida. So she photoshopped all of that together to give me an opportunity to tell the story about the child with the starfish. And many of you have probably heard this before, so I'll keep it short. There's a child walking along the beach and there are tens of thousands of starship, starfish washed up on the beach. And the child is throwing them one at a time into the ocean. And a cynical old man, approximately my age, comes along and says, hey there, boy, you're not doing any good. You're never going to save them all. And the little boy picks up another one and he says, I'll save this one. And he threw it into the ocean. So I think that's a wonderful way to conduct our lives. We don't have a great deal of control. Nobody put us in charge. Nobody ever designated us king for the day. The guy I went to college with, Dusty Tenney, yes, that's really his name. I was a college roommate with him for a while. And his favorite trick was to ask somebody, do you want to be king for a day? And everybody, of course, says yes. And he says, that's great, because the king always buys me lunch. I only fell for that once, to my credit. I want to tell another story. Imagine I came in here, and most people don't know, but the medical profession arose from the academy. University professors were knowledgeable, so people came to them with their ailments. Hey, professor. I have this bad knee. What do you think could be wrong with it? And out of the academy arose the medical profession. So most people tend to think of the medical doctors as being the quote, real doctors. But those real doctors came from university professors who happened to be fairly knowledgeable. If I were to come in here and chat with you for 10 minutes and tell you that you had three years to live, plus or minus 15 minutes, you would think I was insane. You might anyway. And you probably wouldn't take me very seriously. Three years seems like a very short term terminal diagnosis. I'm going to go through a story that I think will convince you that three years, depending upon how you live it, can be a very long period of time. Imagine you're on a deck. You have coffee in your hand, the radio is playing in the background. It's nine o'clock in the morning and you're just getting started on your day. You're on vacation, you're on a deck in a five-story building, you're looking out and the view is beautiful. My photoshopping is not nearly as good as Pauline's. 
So you're looking out from the deck and you see the mushroom cloud and you know what that means. That certainly is not good news. And you realize when the, when the shock wave hits you, you won't survive. Imagine that a 20 foot steel I-beam comes spinning through the air and it's gonna hit you in three seconds and there's nothing you can do, you freeze, you think you're dead by the time I finish this sentence. But alas, the I-beam flies over your head miraculously, there's nothing you can do, you are frozen. The radio comes on with a voice with a special announcement talking about the nuclear bomb that just dropped and indicating that you have three minutes before the shock hits you. Three minutes? You thought you had three seconds. In three minutes, you can scratch out a simple will. You can call somebody you love. You can make peace with your gods. There's any number of things you can do in three minutes. Compared to three seconds, it's a long time. Let's skip a couple of the threes and go to three weeks. You go to your med medical doctor and he tells you after a couple of exams that you have only about three weeks to live. He goes outside of the exam room, run a couple more tests, and you sit there and you think, three weeks? Man, that's not very long. What can I do in three weeks? And he comes back and he tells you instead, there was an error in the test. It looks like you have three months, plus or minus a week or so. Three months? If you thought you had three weeks, three months is forever. Three months compared to the three minutes you had five minutes ago? Three months is a long time. In three months, if you have the money, you can go visit everybody you know. You can complete every relationship in your life. You can cross off many, many things off your bucket list if you have one. Three months can actually be a very long time. I doubt if anybody in this room, or at least very few people in this room, live three years. And lived in a certain way, lived with gratitude, lived with urgency. Three months can seem like a long time. As Homer wrote in the Iliad some 2,800 years ago, any moment might be our last. The paragraph before this one, Homer was describing that the gods envied us. The gods envied us because they live forever. There's nothing new. Every day is the same. Every year is the same. Every millennium is the same. The gods, unlike humans, won't ever be more or less lovely than they are right now. There's no reason to stop and smell the roses. They'll be there tomorrow. They'll be there in a million years. The gods envy us because our lives are short. And if we appreciate the short nature of our lives, then we can live as though our lives are short. We will never be here Again, I'm going, to go, I'm going to show a very short film prepared by a colleague and friend of mine who I've never met. He goes by Tim Bob on his YouTube channel. And in this short video clip, I'm going to describe the rate of environmental change and how important that is to us and every other species on the planet. Briefly describe the exponential function, talk about functional extinction, which is something I spent a lot of time on last night, covering the evidence behind functional extinction or loss of habitat, even for Homo sapiens. And, and that ties directly in with the rate of change. The video describes briefly that it's too late for techno fixes. The time for techno fixes has passed, and I'll show in future slides in a timeline, the evidence behind that. 
And then it talks, just briefly mentions human extinction, how we proceed, talks a little bit about grief, and then it finishes with a note on planetary hospice. So. There were five dinosaurs riding in cars, having a really good time. They said, step on the gas, we'll go really fast, and they did until one got a flat tire. Ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. And he said, go on without me. Then there were four dinosaurs riding in cars, having a really good time. They said, step on the gas, we'll go really fast, and they did until one got a flat tire. Ka-chunk, 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 whoosh. And he said, go on without me. Then there were three dinosaurs riding in cars, having a really good time. They said, step on the gas, we'll go really fast, and they did until one got a flat tire. Ka-chunk, 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 And he said, go on without me. Then there were two dinosaurs riding in cars, having a really good time. They said, step on the gas, we'll go really fast, and they did until one got a flat tire. Ka-chunk, 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 whoosh. And he said, go on without me. Then there was one dinosaur riding in a car, having a really good time. He said, step on the gas, we'll go really fast, and he did until he got a flat tire. Ka-chunk, 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 whoosh. And he said, I know what I'll do, I'll change the tire. And he said, I'll pick up my friends. Then there were five dinosaurs riding in a car, having a really good time. They said, step on the gas, we'll go really fast, and they did, and down the road they went flying. So long. I should point out at this point that I don't know what to do. In last night's presentation, I quoted Van Jones from the Ella Baker Center in Oakland, who in 2007 described being at Davos and hanging out with all the people we think are in charge. And he says, they don't know what to do. Think about that for a minute. We think they're in charge. They don't know what to do. They're just juggling chickens and chainsaws trying to get through another day. I don't know what to do either. So I just thought I'd come clean with that. And perhaps that will facilitate a discussion at the end of this relatively short presentation. I want to show this short video clip that I showed last night just because I think it explains very clearly the exponential function, something that we have a difficult time wrapping our minds around because we were never designed or we never evolved through natural selection to deal with the exponential function. Everybody knows about playing with dominoes, but what you may not know is that a domino can knock over another domino which is about one and a half times larger. So what I have here is a chain of dominoes. Each one is one and a half times larger than the previous one. And the smallest domino is about five millimeters high and one millimeter thick. And I will carefully place it. And there are 13 dominoes. And the largest domino, it weighs about 100 pounds and is more than a meter tall. Ready? Boom. That was 13 dominoes. If I had 29 dominoes, the last domino would be as tall as the Empire State Building.
So imagine, if you will, starting with a domino so small that were I holding it, you could barely see it. And then 29 steps later, you got the Empire State Building. That's astonishing. That's the exponential function for you. And that explains why we have such a hard time coming to grips with it. I'm gonna go through the very barest of evidence in this presentation, because as I indicated, there's lots of places we can find it. A year ago, the planet was at the highest temperature ever with human beings on it, with our species, Homo sapiens, present. And the planet has warmed since then, so I think it's safe to say that we are now at the highest temperature ever experienced by Homo sapiens in our 315,000 year history. Sam Karana, who is a climate scientist who uses a pseudonym, and wisely so, did a little exercise in which he added up some of the self-reinforcing feedback loops, or so-called positive feedbacks, contributing to warming into the near future. He conducted this exercise in July of 2016 and projected a temperature rise of more than 10 degrees Celsius by 2026. I took a more conservative approach in a couple of cases relying upon information more conservative than the very conservative peer-reviewed journal literature, and I came up with only about 8.7 8 degrees above the 1750 baseline that we say marks the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So, Karana's line is the highest or furthest up bright yellow line. My line is a little bit below that. The dashed yellow line is based on a paper in scientific reports from November 13th of last year indicating that a temperature rise to that level would likely cause the extinction of all life on Earth. Karana added one additional feedback that arose within the last month and as a result of that he came up with not a 10C global average temperature rise by 2026, but instead the black line that goes horizontally across the top, right above Earth's temperature history. Considerably higher than the highest temperature experienced by Earth in the last two billion years. And he points out that to think that we can survive such a thing relies strictly on human hubris, not evidence. It's not as if we haven't had a warning or two in the 100 year anniversary of the first big oil well in the United States, 1859, Edward Teller presented at the American Petroleum Institute annual meeting and says as a result of burning fossil fuels, it looks like we're gonna warm the planet considerably. Frank Eichard, the chief of the American Petroleum Institute just a few years later at the annual meeting says, quote, time is running out with respect to the use of fossil fuels. 1965, and bear in mind, this is the chief of the American Petroleum Institute. He's paid to promote the idea of burning oil. And he says, time is running out. We're gonna to have to switch to an economy that is not based on fossil fuels if we expect to survive. 1965 was quite a few years ago. In 1985, Al Gore and Carl Sagan testified before Congress. They were featured in the New York Times, something that would, I suspect, never happen today. And then James Hansen famously gave testimony before the United States Senate in June of 1988. And the latter three people, Al Gore, Carl Sagan, and James Hansen, pointed out that we're in for a really grim future if we don't stop burning fossil fuels very quickly. Well, that was 30 plus years ago. Also 30 years ago, Noel Brian Brown, the director of the New York Office of the United Nations Environment Program, indicated that we have a 10 year window of opportunity to, quote, solve the greenhouse problem. 10 years in 1989. In the last 25 years, we have burned more fossil fuels than in the previous entire extent of the Industrial Revolution. So our response to these warnings has been to step on the gas. 
The United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases in October of 1990 indicated that one degree Celsius was the absolute upper limit. That's one degree Celsius above the 1750 baseline when the global average temperature of the planet was about 13 and a half degrees Celsius. So we had no more than one C before we would trigger the self-reinforcing feedback loops described as rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear responses. And importantly, that could lead to extensive ecosystem damage. The United Nations folks knew at the time, although they seem to deny it today, that we depend upon ecosystems for our own lives. Without the insects, we're in real trouble. I'm sure you've heard about the insect apocalypse. 13 years and two days ago, Time Magazine indicated we should be very worried. Climate change isn't some vague future problem, it's already damaging the planet at an alarming pace. In the 13 years since then, we've burned more fossil fuels than in the 13 year period in history before that. Earth was at this so-called tipping point 13 years ago, just like it was in 1999 according to Noel Brown, and so on. The hits keep coming. Instead of one degree, climate science speaker and writer David Spratt said in 2014 that the self-reinforcing feedback loops were triggered between a quarter and a half a degree C above the 1750 baseline, which happened a long, long time ago, well before anybody in this room was born. Despite all that, despite the fact that we're now at at least one and three quarters degrees above the 1750 baseline, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change concluded in October of last year that we need to limit warning to 1.5 degrees C above the 1750 baseline. Remember, we're at one and three quarters. How do we get back to 1.5 C? Only through miracles. A time machine seems like the most likely route but so far I haven't seen a lot of those for sale. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, indicated in September of last year that we have until 2020 to change course in order to avoid runaway. So we always have a few years, you see, to avoid runaway climate change. We've had a few years since 1965. And yet, what have we done? Our entire mentality in the society is characterized by three simple words. Not the three you think I'm going to whisper in your ear. Must go faster. That's what we do in response to every warning. We abandon the precautionary principle. Must go faster. Paper that came out in, on the 13th of October sorry, the 13th of November last year in the journal Scientific Reports, concludes that at that dotted yellow line, five or six degrees Celsius temperature rise, at that point, we could cause the annihilation of all life on Earth. The senior author of that paper, Strona, correctly points out that even the most tolerant species, which most people would include us in that category, the most tolerant species to temperature rise, ultimately succumb to extinction when the less tolerant species on which they, dis they depend disappear. We don't survive without insects. We don't survive without bees. We don't survive without pollinators. We don't survive without the small organisms that clean the water for us. And we certainly don't survive without food. So the evidence indicates that we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction we have been for a long time. We are in the midst of abrupt climate change and we have been for a while. And as Homer pointed out some 2,800 years ago, any moment might be your last. So what, how to proceed? Well, this, where, this is where it gets a little uncomfortable for me because I'm a scientist. I'm not a counselor. I'm not a therapist. It's pretty interesting that if you go to your medical doctor 
and your medical doctor gives you a short-term terminal diagnosis, you would never expect that person to tell you how to live your life. Right? You would probably take that information from the medical doctor. You might even seek a second source or a third because nobody wants their life to end in a short period of time and it seems important enough to, see a, to seek it a second opinion. And so probably you would then seek counseling of some kind. You would go to a therapist, maybe a psychologist, to deal with this information. It's severe emotional trauma to find out that your days are numbered. So this is where it gets uncomfortable for me because I'm going to provide recommendations. I'm not telling you what to do. I am putting together some information from the peer-reviewed journal literature, including a recent paper by me, and also by a leader in what he calls the death trade, Stephen Jenkinson. And I think these might provide some guidance on where to go from here, but I'm certainly in no position to tell you what to do. So take my recommendation with I don't know, a ton or two of salt. Great quote here from Stephen Jenkinson, the great enemy of grief is hope. Wait a minute. My entire life I heard that hope was unimpeachably good. You don't attack hope. How can we live without hope? Hope is the last thing, the only thing that remained in Pandora's box. Everything else escaped, hope remained. We tend to think of hope as being the best thing that could possibly happen, but I'm gonna go through a couple of definitions here along with this quote from Stephen Jenkinson. Hope is the four letter word for people who are unwilling to know things for what they are. Our time, and he's a contemporary writer and speaker, our time requires us to be hope free to burn through the false choice of being hopeful and hopeless, two sides of the same con job. And he indicates that grief is required to proceed. Attacking hope is not something that makes me particularly popular because we've all heard our entire lives that hope is the best thing we got. Hope is the last thing in Pandora's vessel. How? Can you say hope is a bad thing? In fact, medical doctors through the 1960s and 1970s actually lied to their patients when they had a terminal disease because they were unwilling to dash their hopes. Hope was more important than telling the truth not that long ago. So what is hope? What is it? According to the Merriam Dictionary, the Merriam Webster Online Dictionary, it is to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen or be true. It's a desire. It's a want. It is based on, dare I say it, faith, not evidence. We hope for the best, we plan for the worst. But do we really plan? Or do we spend most of our time just hoping for the best? Given the choice between hope and fear, and I think they're both bad ideas, given the choice between hope and fear, the two four-letter words on the coin that is the future we can't possibly know with great specificity. Given the choice between hope and fear, I think we know which one of those inspires radical action. Consider the Manhattan Project during World War II. Nobody told us we need to have hope. If we just hope for the better future, it's going to work out just fine. If they had, I suspect I'd be speaking German right now. Instead, the fear of Nazi occupation drove us to take radical actions. We started throwing food in our backyards, hickory gardens, they were called. We gave up domestic production of automobiles for two years in this country. What about grief? If grief is required to proceed, and I would modify that slightly, as I'll indicate shortly, 
then what is grief anyway? And I particularly like the Grief Recovery Institute's definition of grief, wishing for a different past. Hope is wishing for a good future, and grief is wishing for a different past. These don't seem like very good ideas to me. If it's all about wishful thinking, where does that leave us with respect to action? We can't change the past. We don't have much control over the future, except with respect to our own small circle of friends and family. Over that future, we have some control. Over tomorrow, we have some control. Beyond that, it gets a little sketchy. And then I wrote in a paper that came out in May of 2019, and you thought I didn't have a time machine. Actually, in a paper that's scheduled to come out in May of 2019, but as with many peer-reviewed journals, it has already been released as of about a week ago. I indicate that the belief in a positive future or hope is not useful when presenting a person with a terminal dis diagnosis. And so physicians did that with encouragement from the medical ethics community in the 60s and 70s. They lied to the patient to give them hope. They didn't tell them they were dying. Today, by the way, we call that malpractice. A doctor can't lie to their patient just so they'll maintain hope. When we thought physicians were gods, we gave them that control over our lives. Now we know better. If we think climate scientists are gods, we give them that control over our lives. We allow them to tell us that we must have hope when there's no basis whatsoever for hope. Wishful thinking, that's what hope is. It's no route to recovery and it might interfere with the ability of a person to complete relationships. So these days, no medical doctor in their right mind would lie to their patients. They might tell them to seek psychological help, to seek counseling, to see a therapist, to deal with the situation. We've come a long way in the last 50 or 60 years. And I think it's time we caught up with that, with that idea at the level of society as well. Hospice is a particularly effective strategy for palliative end-of-life care, and I would argue and have argued that hospice is an obvious strategy to address the near-term demise of Homo sapiens. How do we do that? I'm not sure. And this is where I seek your help. I know that we don't have long. I know that we were born into a terminal condition. After all, birth is a sexually transmitted disease that is proven fatal in every case. Nobody gets out alive. You knew that. You knew that when you were 11. Everybody knows they're going to die. And yet, somehow, we latched on to the infinite growth paradigm and thought that that didn't apply to us. Everybody else is going to die, but I'm going to live to be 100. Or pick your favorite number. So you can take this route. Knowing that you don't have long, you can argue with strangers about politics on the internet to your life's content. Who am I to deprive you of that privilege? It wouldn't be my first choice. For me, the pursuit of excellence, the pursuit of love, involves teaching. And for a long time, that involved teaching in classrooms. And the picture on the right panel shows a student of mine that I hadn't seen for 18 years. And then I ended up seeing her briefly and having lunch with her. And she brought one of the assignments that I had given in my class 18 years earlier. She thought it was so important to the development of her, of her life from that day forward that she brought it with her, just to remind me what the assignment had done for her. And she cried, and I cried, and my partner Pauline cried, and sea level came up, and we contributed to the whole problem. And it was tragic, really. 
So for me, the pursuit of love, the pursuit of excellence, now that I have reached the conclusion that we're in the midst of abrupt, irreversible climate change, those pursuits boil down to providing the full truth, to honestly dealing with the relationships in my life. And that includes the relationships that transpire over a long distance or that only last a day, as with Bill Nye, the other science guy. At some point I know that I will give my last PowerPoint presentation. I just haven't bothered to Photoshop my face into there yet. Between now and then I will dance. The subtitle of my latest book, which came out earlier this year, is Dancing at the Edge of Extinction. Because why not? We can grieve. We can recover from that grief, as recommended by the Grief Recovery Institute. And I would recommend doing that. There are steps that we can take. What do those look like? What does planetary hospice look like? What does it mean to go into hospice at the level of 7.7 .7 billion people when fewer than 2% of those people know where we're even headed? We can use anticipatory grief at scale. Anticipatory grief is, let me give an example, most of you have had somebody in your life and they became old and their organs were failing and you knew and everybody knew that it was just a matter of time, maybe days or weeks before that person died. But you know they're going to die. There's nothing that can be done beyond making them comfortable. That's anticipatory grief. Scale is grieving at the level of society. Think 9-11. Think the Jewish community during World War II. So we have a few examples of large-scale grief. We have a few examples of anticipatory grief, and I think that's what we're facing. What are the characteristics of hospice? What does it mean to go into hospice? For the person who's in hospice, it means being comfortable. It means completing relationships. It means being completely honest with the people in their life. I'm sure there's more, but I've never been in hospice. So this again is where I'm seeking help. I'm not sure where to turn. I'm too young and in too good of health for this. And most of, our, most of you are as well. Should we scale up palliative end-of-life care? And if so, how? And finally, if you see something, should you say something? Should you share this information with the people in your life? Should you tell the people in your life that we don't have long? Or not? Not everybody wants to know. I used to tell everybody. I'd be walking down the street, somebody would say hello, and I would assume that was an invitation to talk about near-term human extinction as a result of abrupt climate change. You can imagine how well that went. I don't do that anymore, and at many of my presentations, sorry, excluding this one, because I forgot, I start with the story of an asteroid. If you know there's an asteroid coming to Earth, and we know with great certainty when it's going to strike and exactly where, and it's going to remove all habitat for humans and therefore kill all humans within a very short period of time, do you want to know? Do you want to know when it's going to hit? So I should ask that question, right? Because if you don't want to know, then you, at least you have an opportunity to leave, because that's basically what I'm talking about. I don't know the minute the asteroid hits, but it's on the way. We don't have long. So should you tell the people in your life? I think at the very least, knowing about abrupt climate change, knowing we are at the highest temperature on this planet experienced by Homo sapiens, knowing that there are many routes to functional extinction and therefore to loss of habitat for human animals, and consequently to the extinction of the human race. Knowing that, for me, brings liberation. How could that be? 
And I hear this from a lot of people, most notably millennials. Millennials tell me all the time that they always knew they'd been screwed over by my generation. Millennials aren't real good at making me feel good. I don't know what's going on there. So they know, and when I tell them how and why and approximately when we get to this situation, they're like, yeah, of course. And so they, they treat this information and respond with a feeling of liberation. Finally, somebody told them that you can't shit in your nest for your entire life and not get a little poop on your feathers. How could we ever think that could be the case? How could we think that we could have infinite progress all the way up to and including so-called smartphones without any consequences? It's a finite planet. There's only one. And here we are, 7.7 .7 billion of us muddling on thinking that 20 years from now is going to be like a new and improved version of today. Because that's what happened in each 20 year chunk of time in the past. What do we do? How do we act? I don't know. Beyond the level of individual, beyond the level of me and the relatively few people I interact with on a daily basis, I don't know. I know to treat people with honesty and with respect. I know how to be decent to people. And maybe that's all we ever had. Maybe all we ever had is here and now and in the people in our small circle. That's what we have some control over. Beyond that, trying to change a fundamentally corrupt political system. I mean, I'm not, I'm not discouraging you from doing that. I'm, it's not at all clear to me how that would lead to positive outcomes, but again, I don't know what to do. It kind of makes you wonder why you came, doesn't it? I would love at this point to facilitate a discussion rather than me having, having me talk at you. So if anybody has questions, comments, and Cache was going to do something right here, right in this space, and she ran away. It's like we had it all planned out. So let's start with a question. Sir? Uh, first, uh, just bring up, um, we have hit the acceleration button. If you uh, remember that movie that Bell Telephone made in 1953 called The uh, Unchained Goddess, remember they discussed climate change, potential. Uh, the ice caps melt, uh, my ice caps down there, I the water. They also told us what the carbon dioxide output in the United States was. It was 6 billion tons a year. Uh, we peaked uh, in 2010 at 5 billion tons. So we made some progress in reducing our output. So it's not like everybody was getting the gas. What's happened is third world countries would like to live at um, the kind of lifestyles that is that we live in. Thank you. And their main source of energy has been coal. And so the rest of the planet is not doing uh, The rest of the planet is not doing that stuff. But um, I don't think we've been, you know, I think the uh, thing, yes, is, is, uh, is not exponential because if it were exponential, we'd be, the U.S. would be putting on something like 18 billion tons at this point. Similarly, uh, in 1900, there was some major discussions, a lot like this, about how we were all going to starve to death because there's only one billion people on the planet because we were running out of fertilizer. There wasn't any fertilizer. They were figuring out how to make uh, nitrogen and ammonia. I personally know that you can take carbon dioxide, put it in salt water, and put it down into the salt, and it will all uh, turn into dolomite in about two years instead of taking 10,000 years. So there are ways to do this. It's just nobody's interesting. I also know the planet has been quite a bit hotter than the degrees you were showing back during uh, Jurassic times. And uh, most uh, ecosystems are quite adaptable and will survive us. We may not, but um, the other critters will. Polar bears are actually um, figuring out how to adapt. They're having some trouble with the uh, grizzlies because 
prisons don't want competition, but they'll work it out. Uh, it'd be nice if they could keep working on ice. But, you know, all I'm saying is, and I think you're absolutely right, we should live like we're going to all die tomorrow. That's true whether or not we're all going to die. Right. So you started with the Unchained Goddess, the 1953 film, and remind me again who made the film? Frank Capra. Right, Frank, Frank Capra. That's right. And so he, we, I could add that to my timeline, uh, indicating that we need to maintain carbon dioxide at some level in the atmosphere well below where we're at right now. Yes, you're absolutely right. The Earth has experienced a higher temperature than we're at right now. We're about at the shoulder of this person in the lower right. So that's where the line is right now. We've had humans at, we've had Homo sapiens, our species, at approximately the temperature we are right now. What's important here is the rate of change. During the Great Dying, some 252 million years ago, we lost about 95% of the species on the planet because of abrupt climate change. The current rate of change, the rate of increase of temperature, is at least 10 times faster than it was during the Great Dying. Rate of change is hugely important. Already, according to a paper published, a peer-reviewed paper published in 2013, we are outstripping the ability of vertebrates to keep up by a factor of 10,000 times to ongoing linear climate change, 10,000 times. A paper published last year indicates that the ability of mammals to keep up is being outstripped by relatively gradual climate change by several orders of magnitude as well, and we're vertebrate mammals. So the rate of change is what's critically important here, and as you indicated, I, I don't see us making significant changes. No, the United States has no longer experienced exponential change in terms of CO2 outlet, but the world is more than making up for us. The, the so-called third world countries, such as China, are continuing to burn coal. And by the way, it's a good thing. What? If we stop burning coal, the aerosols fall out of the sky within six weeks, and the temperature of the planet skyrockets to a much, much higher level than it is right now within a matter of weeks. So this is something that has been called the McPherson paradox, named by somebody else, not by me that we are heating the planet through the use of burning fossil fuels and we will heat it even faster if we stop burning fossil fuels. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Given that situation, and given that apparently we have no interest whatsoever in stop burning fossil fuels at the level of 7.7 .7 billion people, then the question remains, how do we live? What do we pursue? What is important to us? What matters to us as individuals and as families and as communities? Those are the primary questions I wanted to bring up that I don't know the answers to. And I just want to offer an opportunity to see the love offering to Dr. Kristen Jobles and those in his work at the charge to us and shares his precious time with us. And if you feel appreciative And, and, and we have an, an auction, and I think, I want to say, let's see, we start the bid with my favorite number, which is 11. This is uh, drawn by a local artist, Randy, and it's the, you know, Fairbanks Truckers contemplating the impending apocalypse, and you see the, the man, he's hungry, and he's thinking about the, the leg of chicken or the bird, and then you have the bird who's hungry, and he's, Dreaming of piping out the eyeballs of the, the man. So, a little humorous thing. Can we start with a, a, a bid of $11? Anybody can offer $11 for this beautiful piece of art. I see 11. Can someone offer 12? A $12 auction. It's 12 to the man on the side. Anyone? 
Going for 13. Lucky number 13. Anybody, anybody? 13 for this beautiful piece of art. I see it. Hand 13. Going again now for 14. Anyone willing to contribute $14? I see a 14. How about 15? Come on, side of the room. Your hands and ears go up for 15. This piece of art will be yours. 14 going once, twice, and sold. Thank you. <laughs> Answers especially welcome. Thank you for that. And I would love to think that there is a way out, even though I don't see what it is. I made sacrifices that, to my knowledge, no other academic has ever made. I lived off grid for 10 years. I voluntarily left a job that paid me a lot of money and required zero work whatsoever. And I left, that, I left active service at the University of Arizona 10 years ago because I just assumed that people would follow my lead. Cue laughter. <laughs> and few people did. And it's a good thing because of the aerosol masking effect. If industrial activity had been released reduced by as little as 35%, that would cause a one degree Celsius global average temperature rise, and there's no way for humans to survive that in the six weeks that would 
would be required, or trees on the planet either for that matter. And because of this aerosol masking effect, I don't see a way out. I don't see how we can maintain the aerosols in the atmosphere that are needed to cool the planet while also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I dropped, I dropped a zero for years and grew my own food, all of it, and made the sorts of sacrifices that I see very few people willing to make. And it didn't move the needle one bit. I would love to see entire communities take action. I just don't know what that action is. Because if it means reducing carbon dioxide emissions, particularly stop burning dirty coal, then that points to a really profoundly bad future because of abrupt rise in global average temperature. No other climate scientist will tell you that. No media outlet will tell you that global dimming is perhaps the most important facet of climate change. Nobody's talking about it. The famous, recently famous climate scientist, mostly from England, Jim Mandel and Rupert Reed, not to mention Michael Mann for a long time, are just telling people we need to reduce emissions. That's not the, re that's not the answer. That's not a viable response. Because just re reducing emissions means reducing the aerosol masking effect and driving us to extinction even faster than continuing to heat the planet. So the evidence indicates me that there's no large scale strategy that offers a way out. I would love to see one. I'm no fan of my own death at an early age, much less of the 200 species a day we're driving to extinction, much less of every human being on the planet. I don't know the way out and I have not seen any strategy presented that offers a way out. That's why I want to have the question, I want to facilitate the, the discussion of how we deal with planetary hospice. What do we do if we're Wiley Coyote and we went over the cliff and we just haven't bothered to look down yet? I think that's where we are as a society. I haven't seen any evidence to suggest otherwise. Sir. Cache? Yes. Do you have a mic? I have a mic. Um, oh. I, I was wondering, Dr. McPherson, if you have an opinion of the Paris Climate Accords, which was supposed to be the political process that would lead to a limit in global warming. Were, they, were the leaders misleading us, or what, what was the nature of the Paris Climate Accords? Well, that's when the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came up with the idea that one and a half degrees would be a lot better than two degrees, which is true, except that at the time we were well past one and a half degrees above the 1750 baseline. And because of the aerosol masking effect or global dimming, I don't think there's any way, I've certainly never read or heard about a way to avoid going well beyond two. So we can continue grinding the living planet into dust through industrial activity and thereby warm the planet, or we can cease industrial civilization, we warm the planet even faster. And the rate of change in both cases is outstripping the ability of vertebrates and mammals to keep up. The IPCC has become part of the show, part of the show of distraction as far as I'm concerned. There is no reasonable way out. We can't hold the global average temperature at 1.5, we're at one and three quarters right now. And global dimming accounts for, according to the latest evidence published in Science in January of this year, we have greatly underestimated the impact of global dimming. And the first paper on the topic, which came out in December 2011, penned by James Hansen and colleagues, indicates a 1.2 plus or minus 0.2 degrees Celsius temperature rise when we turn off industrial civilization. And shortly thereafter, he did an interview with James Hansen and said that that would happen within five days. You can't warm the planet an additional one degree Celsius in five days or five weeks or five months and expect to see any potential for migration of trees to new areas or most other organisms for that matter. Yeah. But there are, I'm reporting an interglacial event that has occurred. 
we're in entry ratio right now, and it's supposed to be getting over. And in fact, we have hot spells that are a lot more than one degree on average. I mean, even though we get 10 times the effect up here, critters survive. Yes. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, though, Rick, but there are also rapid things that happen, and critters are adaptable. And humans probably are. We never had to deal with this because we made our own mess. But we're all adaptable, including the, the critters. But what you're talking about is short-term changes. You're talking about the weather, not the climate. I understand the difference between the weather and the climate. But um, there are there are going to be places that are going to be in drought, and there are going to be places that are going to be too much rain, and there are going to be places that are all kinds of different things. And some places will make it, and some places will won't. But eventually, somebody's going to make it through. If we do it the hard way. What does that mean? What is the hard way? The hard way means we don't suppress the carbon dioxide. We don't, uh, we don't stop doing anything. We don't, in fact, do any geoengineering or putting ourselves up there on our own or uh, uh, feeding, the, uh, feeding the critters in the downwind side of the Galapagos Islands. Uh, lots of, uh, so the plankton are blooming like crazy. And, and basically, we have a geoengineered planet that we can do this. Or we let it take care of itself, and the population will crash, and we'll come out of it somehow. But that's going to be very painful. Uh, given that we will then experience the catastrophic uncontrolled meltdown of 450 plus nuclear power plants around the world. They won't melt down. They don't melt down. The new ones don't melt down at all. And in fact, what happens is they are designed to uh, work so that they do not melt down. That's the new designs. Uh, they're smaller, they're safer, and in, in fact, in fact, what's going to happen is once we've got uh, 150 feet of water and everything's stabilized, we're going to fight over the land that opens up in anarchy and ruins our uh, tropical forests. Well, I, I don't, I can't even imagine that that would be an outcome. We have 450 plus nuclear power plants that are not following the new design. They're following the Fukushima design. Fukushima is an extinction level event for humans all by itself, Fukushima, given enough time. Fukushima was because they put the, um, the emergency power underneath the power plant and these things could only run as long as they were pumping. And nobody thought about it then. There yeah. are 99 GE Mark III power plants, just like Fukushima, around the world. Most of them are at or near sea level. Three Mile Island, Island was a warning we ignored. Chernobyl was a warning we ignored. I don't see any way out with respect to the nuclear power plants. Nobody, absolutely nobody, is talking about decommissioning. And it takes 50 to 60 years to decommission a single nuclear power plant. There's no money in it, so we aren't decommissioning any of them at this point. Nuclear power plants don't become carbon neutral until they've been in place for 20 or 30 years because of the cement needed to build them. To claim that they are energy neutral or energy zero is ignoring the concrete that goes into them. The same is true of solar panels. Do you think a solar panel comes free from the solar panel ferry? No, it actually requires an enormous amount of rare metals, which are called rare metals for a reason. We can continue to grind the planet into dust, and I've no doubt we will for as long as we can, but civilization, as pointed out by at least three papers in the peer-reviewed journal now, is a heat engine. Civilization is a heat engine. We can keep the heat engine going or we can turn it off, and if we turn it off, we heat the planet even faster. These are facts. In the back. Doing research on 
research this summer on parasites and how climate change affects their shedding rate, um, so how they're released um, to those high um, hosts. And I was wondering if you have any recommendations of what I should kind of look into this summer, just because it's such a broad topic and as much as I can search for me, what recommend I look into or something that really intrigued you um, when you started out this Thank you for that question, and let's talk about it afterwards so that we don't take up everybody's time to talk about that particular aspect. And we should rope in your academic advisor, too, to make sure it fits into somebody's overall research program. And I very much appreciate your interest. I would encourage people, first and foremost, and especially young people such as yourself, to do the work you love and to do it well. To not do something just because that's what everybody does, is jump on the treadmill. But instead to do something that you actually enjoy doing. And at your age that might mean one of millions of different things because you actually have a flexible brain still. Is there a question screaming to get out? Well, it's just like why is it like have you ever like looked into it though? Have you ever like heard of it? Yes, yes, I know what you mean. And and there was a battle between Tesla and Edison and Edison's ideas won. For, yeah. Uh, okay, so for better and for worse, and almost certainly motivated by money, Edison's ideas won. We aren't going back. Money is not relevant to this story. Money is just something we dreamed up that we imagine into existence. The Federal Reserve Bank produces more money than any of us in this room can possibly imagine every single day. People tell me all the time, what if we, instead of having the military work on securing oil so that we can keep the lights on, let's have the military do something else. Let's take all that spending and put it into more reasonable solutions. We aren't going to do that because there are no more reasonable solutions to the predicament when, in which we're embroiled. The money runs the show. And it has for a very long time, as evidenced by the Tesla case. I'd love to have that time machine so we can have this conversation at a time when it matters. It seems to me we made a few million choices along the way to becoming the wise ape, homo sapiens. And essentially every one of those forks in the road we came into, we took the wrong path whether it was harnessing fire or harnessing the atom, we took the wrong route. And so here we are beyond the point at which we have triggered those self-reinforcing feedback loops. We now have an understanding of global dimming that we lacked until 2011. And all of that points to a situation that doesn't look particularly solvable to me. And I'm not suggesting that anybody give up. I just don't know what that means. Do we have so any other questions? questions? It has sort of become transparently obvious to everyone on the planet that what it's happening. I just had a conversation with three of my uh, old high school buddies, guy lives in Texas now. And I said, you know, I was thinking if you do
Yeah, I think the people who continue to deny anthropogenic climate change now will draw their last breath denying anthropogenic climate change. And I'm beyond the point of trying to convince people who cannot be convinced by evidence. If, if evidence doesn't do, do it for you, then I'm not particularly interested in spending my time on that conversation. I'm, I'm frequently asked to debate people about flat earth, space aliens, and God. I won't have any of those debates. It only lends credibility. I also won't have a debate about anthropogenic climate change for the same reason. It only lends credibility to the idea that it's not happening. I agree. And so for me, that comes down to the bottom line here. Do we say something? Do we say something if it's only going to be unkind, if it destroys a relationship or contributes negatively to a relationship? We're, we're beyond the point as a society of being able to make a change. We're in the midst of abrupt, irreversible climate change. I challenge you to find a single climate scientist who will admit or who would propose that it's possible to stop warming. I don't think you'll find it. Bill McKibben admitted as, as much nearly 10 years ago. We can't stop it. It's out of human hands. So you can spend your time arguing with those soon-to-be ex-friends of yours or you can talk about something else. And that's where I'm at with lots of my relationships that have become very superficial, very shallow relationships. And so I don't spend much time on them. Why bother? I'm interested in conversations of merit. So for me, I'm interested in living with death in mind. I'm interested in living with urgency. I'm interested in living with gratitude. These are the things that are important to me. I'm not interested in talking to the people that used to be in my life, used to be very important in my life, because I have very little to say to them anymore. And this includes people who were very close to me. Let go or be dragged. I got dragged enough. Yeah. Right. Uh, a paper by Maslowski and colleagues in the 2012 issue of the Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences projected an ice free Arctic in 2016, plus or minus three years. And we've dodged six bullets so far. It would surprise me if we got through this year with ice still on the Arctic Ocean. This is floating ice. This is not land ice, so it's melting, does not contribute significantly to sea level rise. But the Arctic is the planetary air conditioner. It's what keeps the planet cool. And specifically, the difference between the temperature in the Arctic and the temperature at the equator exerts considerable control over atmospheric physics at the level of the entire planet. 
it is because that ice is disappearing and because the Arctic is warming that we are seeing what's called hurricanes in the Midwestern United States. Hurricanes in the Midwestern United States. And as a consequence, the farmers have all of their grain in silos as a result of political steps leading to a tariff. So they got nobody to sell to. So an enormous amount of grain is stored in silos in the Midwestern United States right now, and those silos are underwater. And every civilization before this one has declined or collapsed because of the inability to grow, store, and distribute grains at scale. If we can no longer grow, distribute, grow, store, and distribute grains at scale, I can't see a way that this civilization survives. Last year's grain crop is underwater, and that was supposed to be the stored food for the near future. It's impossible to plant right now throughout much of the Midwestern United States because it's underwater. You don't reap, you don't reap what you don't sow. And we're not sowing a lot of grains right now that historically have been in the ground at this point. So the president of Finland, who has an unpronounceable last name, so I won't even try, in August 28th, 2017, in a joint press conference in the Oval Office with President Trump said, and this summarizes nicely the scientific information on the topic, he said, if we lose the Arctic, we lose the, the globe. That is reality. And what he was referring to was loss of Arctic ice leading to the loss of habitat for humans on the planet. We haven't had an ice-free Arctic in three million years roughly 10 times the run of Homo sapiens on the planet. So it's pretty difficult for me to imagine a situation in which there would be habitat for human animals on the planet in the absence of ice in the Arctic. That's the planetary air conditioner. We turn off the air conditioner and the planet heats up catastrophically. According to even papers in the corporate media, we're headed for a Cretaceous Earth or a dinosaur Earth within a short period of time. And the rate, again, the rate is what is so important here. The rate is occurring so much more rapidly than vertebrates or mammals or grain crops can keep up that we're going to be left behind. Will a few individuals survive in bunkers for a few years? Maybe, but we're not coming back. The planet is not going to become more habitable in less than several million years as was the case with all five of the previous mass extinction events. So it's not like we can bunker down and wait this thing out for 10 years or 20 years. We're talking instead about millions of years before the planet becomes habitable again, before it goes beyond really small organisms like bacteria and fungi and microbes. So if we lose the Arctic ice, because of the latent heat, because of the methane release, because of the rapid heating of the planet due to the lack of albedo or reflectance, because of all these factors added up together, if we lose the Arctic ice, we lose habitat for human beings on the entire planet in a relatively short period of time. I don't know whether that's this year or next year or the year after that. And from a fossil record perspective, from a geological perspective, of course it doesn't matter whether it's this year or next year or 2020 or 2025, but for you and me it makes a hell of a difference. And I get that. I would love to be able to tell everybody their expiration date. You know, my favorite thing would be if it's, if it's written on your forehead and only you can't read it because then everybody you meet knows your death date. And if I'm shaking your hand and I read on there that it's your death date today, I'm not gonna get to know you very well. Sorry, but we don't have long. Then that would be the real opportunity to get to know us when it's the only half day. I think you'd mention that one of your quotes. Yeah, that might be true. That might be the, 
you know, you might be able to spend that half a day. You might be their best friend. You might make a lot of money at this. <laughs> In any event, because we've never experienced an ice-free Arctic before, in human history, it's pretty difficult to say whether it leads to a rapid temperature rise in a week or a month or a year. But certainly we're headed in that direction in a very short period of time. Another question? I'm a huge fan of taking what a Buddhist would call right action. I'm also a huge fan of taking what a Buddhist would say, not being attached to the outcome. I'm not a Buddhist. What is right action in this case? I think right action is living fully, living with intention, living urgently with death in mind. I think taking right action means pursuing excellence and pursuing love. I think that that can apply beyond the level of the family and up to the level of the community. Will it help? I think not, but certainly not if it's not done. So we also should act as if, as if we can make a difference. As if taking right action will matter. After all, what better measure of our character than how we act in the face of impossible odds? If you can't win, if you can't break even, if you can't get out of the game, as indicated by the first three laws of thermodynamics, then should you do nothing? No, of course not. That would be ridiculous. The survival rate amongst Jews in Germany during World War II who resisted occupation was much higher than the survival rate of those who didn't. In the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, those who resisted and escaped had a higher survival rate than those who, did, who attempted nothing. It was still vanishingly small. It was still nearly zero. But for those few individuals, it mattered. And the same applies here. We have control or influence over a relatively small circle of people in our lives. The people we see on a daily or a weekly basis. That's it. Maybe at the level of community. Can we scale that up so that it matters? Can we treat the people around us as if they matter? Can we act with decency and respect and love? Can we do that beyond the level of our household? That would be a fine way to start. The Green New Deal is an attempt to maintain an unsustainable set of living conditions. And had it started 40 or 50 years ago, it might have made a difference. But now you can't even get a single Democrat to vote for it. So all of that points to me to taking action where we know it matters and that's in our individual lives, between you and me, between the people we ha have interactions with on a regular basis. Can we scale up beyond that to the level of community? Sure. So, so many things to be done, so little time. 
Priorities matter. Uh, have you read Leaves of Grass? Walt Whitman? I am large. I contain multitudes. There's a great book by Joanna Basie called Act of Hope, and it's worth a read. Um, it, are there more questions or comments? I don't want anyone to miss their chance. Um, and I do want to remind you that tomorrow night at 7 o'clock is going to be a, a dialogue at the table where we're just talking amongst each other, talking about the ideas we do want to bring to our community and what we will do. I will just uh, conclude the night tonight if there are no other questions. And if you have one, please do not hesitate to raise your hand because we want to hear you all. Uh, but just to say, we are not going to stop living our lives for the sake of nature. We're going to live every day until we don't have another day. And I'm going to do it with a smile on my face, and I'm going to do it in active service. And I'm not concerned with the news that I'm going to die. I knew it for many, many years. And to imagine that it's coming soon liberates me. Personally, I feel quite liberated. I feel very empowered with this information, and I feel like a sense of urgency, and I feel uh, like inspiring the people in my life, and the students that I work with, and the new people that come into my world. And I'm going to continue doing that and celebrating that every single day. I also have three beautiful animals, and I spend a lot of time cuddling and loving on them, and that brings a lot of joy. Um, so I encourage you to get a pet <laughs> if you don't have one. Um, Lastly, continue to lift each other up. This is a time on the planet, above all times, in my opinion, to raise each other's spirits. And Dr. Guy McPherson is not here to bring our spirits down. He's here to help inspire us to empower ourselves to live the lives that we want. And I intend to do exactly that and to stand in front of any audience and make that claim and follow suit with my actions. So don't feel like this information uh, renders you completely useless. Not the case. Feel empowered, feel activated, and live your lives strongly. Um, 
the potential for Antarctica to serve as a planetary air conditioner is very limited. We are already seeing the jet streams from the northern and southern hemisphere cross and intermix. There is little doubt that it will remain cooler in the southern hemisphere, especially near Antarctica, than it is in the rest of the planet. However, once we lose the aerosol masking effect, the rapid rise in temperature will apply globally. At what point do we lose habitat for all the organisms that protect and provide pollination services and cleaning of the water and so forth? I don't know. Antarctica, the latest research published in Nature Communications within the last week indicates that a size of Antarctica, a chunk of Antarctica the size of Manhattan is about ready to fall off and go into the sea. And unlike Arctic sea ice, Antarctic ice is land-based, it's terrestrial ice. So when that chunk of ice falls into the sea, it will raise sea level in a very short period of time, almost certainly enough to lead to the near-term collapse of civilization because of so many members of the human population live within a very short distance from the ocean. And okay, I understand that. But I'm also thinking the, uh, the, the video you started with, I mean, okay, um, so I would, the optimistic side of me would see that, uh, I can see a catastrophe being almost inevitable. But if you have to go to the, uh, as it gets, uh, as the problem gets more severe, would that spur, would that spur enough people The problem is there is nothing to be done at the level of society. Civilization is a heat engine based on the laws, not the strong suggestions, but the laws of thermodynamics. This is a fact. If we, if we reduce industrial activity by as little as 35%, we lose a significant amount of the aerosol masking effect, and so the planet heats up even faster. What to do? We've triggered at least six dozen self-reinforcing feedback loops that point toward this being unstoppable for me. Now, that is not, this, this does not mean that you should forego action. I have never said that we should forego action. I have taken radical actions myself that has cost me every relationship in my life and every dime. So don't even suggest that I'm proposing we not take action. That's just ridiculous. The problem is, I don't know what the actions are. Because of this catch-22. And there are people a lot smarter than me who have been working on this very issue for many, many years, and I don't see any proposed actions coming from those folks. So as I indicated when I began this presentation, and halfway through, and at the end, I don't know what to do beyond the way we live our personal lives, beyond the conduct of us as individuals. I don't know what to do at the level of society, and I suspect nobody else does either, or we would be encouraged to do those things.
with your financial situation. We are not starting, we're not going to push this. Okay. Their uh, way of dealing with it is they have uh, villages all over the place, so they can go back and forth between them, so the cops go to one place and go. Uh, the whole point of the global economy will be to um, be able to move crops around all over the place, depending on what's going on where. Unfortunately, we have folks in this country who think global economy is stupid. Uh, but it, it would, in fact, be one way of dealing with the problem of the grain underwater in the States if it's not underwater, say, in the Soviet Union or somewhere, or they still in Russia, whatever. So if we're working planet-wide together, we can do things. There's all kinds of things we could do if we could work together. What's happening is uh, we're insisting on doing this the hard way, which means it's going to be very painful and not many are going to survive. But um, you can sequester that CO2. You can sequester it right when it comes out. And the Chinese are going to stop burning coal because they can't breathe. Just like we stopped and the British stopped because they can't breathe. And if the Earth's cells are a problem, next thing you know, we're going to be putting rockets up there and dumping stuff in the atmosphere to meet the artificial aerosols. So, and in 1900, they were convinced there was no way we could stop having mass starvation because of the Well, here's the wishful thinking. Good. Here, here. Well, I think that concludes our discussion. If anyone wants to come down and visit with Dr. McPherson, we'll be here for a few minutes. Um, again, we have his most recent book for sale, the hard copy and the soft copy. I encourage you to take a, a copy home. Um, at the end, this is Dr. McPherson's phrase, at the end, only love reigns, and love is a very powerful energy, and we really value it in that way. Thank you for coming, Dr. McPherson, Professor Emeritus, University of Arizona. Thank you all.